views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to today's verdict. I'm your host and trial attorney, David Lesh. We have two interesting topics today, good cause legislation and mediation. Two great guests, John Schmidt, mediation, Bronx defenders, good cause legislation. Stay with us. Today's verdict has so much more coming up. All right, welcome back to today's verdict. I'm your host and trial attorney, uh, David Lesh. We're going to be talking about a good cause legislation with um, the Bronx Defenders, one of our uh, favorite uh, people um, who come on the show. We have a Sia Hegg Day here today. Sia, how are you doing today? Doing well, David. Thanks so much for having me. It's our pleasure. I want to um, I want to step back first and talk a little bit about the eviction moratorium. Um, some of our viewers didn't even understand really what that was. Um, can you maybe give the viewers a little bit of a synopsis of what the eviction moratorium uh, was, uh, because it's not around anymore, and maybe why, and we're going to, then we're going to move into the good cause legislation and talk about why that's so important. So let's, let's start with um, the eviction moratorium, if we could. Sure. So the eviction moratorium was the result and the product of months and months and months of a fight from the tenant movement. Um, across the state of New York. Um, there were multiple eviction moratorias that were passed in other states, but New York really did take um, a huge step in having a, a very robust law that was codified under the, the former Cuomo administration in December of 2020. Um, prior to that, we had a series of executive orders that the, the governor's office had promulgated um, that said that there would be a ban on evictions and, and by ban on evictions, it was limited to um, certain kinds of residential evictions and, and of course commercial, but in, in the kind of contours of the, the actual moratorium law that came out, um, there was a, a very tenant favorable component of that that said that if a tenant um, files a self-attested hardship declaration, declaration of hardship that um, attests to either financial hardship related to the COVID pandemic or um, risk of, you know, risk getting COVID-19 if they were to move and, and have to relocate kind of in the midst of this crisis. Um, they would be grandfathered in or, or I guess um, phased into these protections that would, that would offer them um, a stay on any pending eviction case, their landlords would not be able to bring a future case against them or file a case against them for non-payment of rent, um, which is the largest category of cases uh, that we've seen in the pandemic under the Office of Court Administration's reports and data. Um, and there was, a time, there was a time limit for that. I mean, there was a date sometime in January, right? Yes. Yeah, so that's actually, that's a good thing to know. So when, when the first moratorium was passed in, like I said, December of 2020, I think it went until about May. It was May 1st or May 15th of 2021. And then that was extended. Um, we hit another crossroads around August when um, when Governor Hochul came in and had to convene a special session to re-extend or recodify a whole new moratorium when the Supreme Court of the United States had um, invalidated the protections under New York. So it's a separate uh, issue altogether. But basically, the, the moment in time that we're in now was that the, the most recent moratorium on evictions, which um, was due to expire on January 15th, has now expired. It was not extended. Um, and of course, that's the moment of time that we're in right now where there's- What does that mean? When, when we say expired, yeah. what can landlords now do that they could not do during the eviction moratorium? Yeah. So landlords were still able to, um, you know, to serve tenants with what's called a predicate notice, which is a written notice that they have to give under, um, under, for, for, for legal uh, protection, or sorry, I'll rewind back. The the predicate notice would, let's say if it's a non-payment of rent case, landlords need to provide written notice to their tenants saying that if you, do, if you don't pay rent or if you're not paying the alleged rent that's owed, we will start a case against you. Um, those cases were, were still being, if my, if my understanding is correct, they were still being fi filed, but they were not being calendared per se. So there was a stay in the courts where 
you know, new cases were not being um, given a court date and tenants who especially had applied for emergency rental assistance through the state's ERAP program that the Office of um, Temporary Disability Assistance had been administering were also afforded an additional stay. So um, the difference now is that those prior cases, of course, there's a huge backlog of cases, especially in the Bronx, where we've had the highest rate of eviction filing state, really citywide, and, and, and I would not be surprised if it's statewide as well. Um, we have seen landlords and, and really the court system go back now from pre-pandemic times, if we could remember what that was like, um, and, and file or I guess revisit cases on the calendar. And so that's, well, I, you know, I know now as a referee, by the way, you know, yeah. for two years, I wasn't asked to sell any property and I am all of a sudden getting flooded, um, uh, with, from, um, owners, um, who, who now have, um, or should I say banks who want to sell property that was in foreclosure and it was stayed for two years. So it's almost like things are kind of getting back to normal, which leads us now to finally really while you're here to talk yeah. a little about the good cause legislation. Let's tell the viewers about that if you could see it. Sure. So the good cause legislation, it's one of the, the, the kind of big hot ticket items and uh, what we're what we're really fighting for in terms of housing protections and, and tenant rights um, across the state right now in our housing justice for all coalition and the right to counsel for coalition that Bronx Defenders is a part of has been really um, driving the, the ship forward. Good cause eviction um, is, it, it, it sounds by its title like a bill that would kind of authorize evictions, which is which is seem, seemingly a little bit, um, you know, contradictory to what we we are standing for, sort of as, as um, housing justice uh, advocates. But the good cause, cause eviction bill, um, in fact, prohibits landlords for filing new eviction cases without cause. So what that would mean, um, the the tens of thousands of households across the state, and this is this is more so the case I would say outside of New York City, but in New York City, I think the proportion is about, I think it's about half and half, where there are about you know fifty percent of apartments that are rent stabilized, and there are a ton more that um, are are unregulated, which means that landlords do not have the obligation to renew a lease at the end of a lease term. Um, they can uh, up a, up a tenant's rent the next year to um, an unlimited or an unregulated limit, which of course puts tenants in a position. Or we've seen this happen a lot with our clients, where um, the Bronx having one of the highest rates of unemployment in the country during the pandemic, having um, obviously put scores of individuals who are um, of the the socioeconomic class that we um, advocate for in housing court unable to pay rent for reasons that are not their fault. And uh, landlords saying that, you know what, if you can't, if you can't pay this rent, then like, we're just gonna, we're not gonna deal with renewing your lease anyway. And, um, you know, we don't have a right to do that anyway under the, the current the property laws. So we are landlord tenant laws. So we can, we can move forward with what's called a no cause holdover filing in housing court. And this bill would um, create very, very explicit categories of what good cause would mean for landlords to be able to um, not, let's, yeah. Let, let's talk about some of those um, ways that a landlord that would be able to. Let's, sure. let's start that way. Sure. So one of, again, the most common uh, case categories that we've seen, as I mentioned, is, is non-payment of rent. Um, however, in, in this bill, there is a kind of twofold purpose, one of which would say that landlords like I said, do not have, they, they should not be able to move forward with filing an eviction case against a tenant just because they don't want to renew a lease. Um, and the second of which it doesn't quite provide rent caps, but it does, it does have language that specifies that tenants can contest unreasonable rent increases in housing court as a legal defense. Uh, so and, and we're not talking about necessarily government housing. We're talking about any housing, any private uh, unregulated housing. So, so if, right. I, if somebody owned a, you know, a two family bedroom or yes. an apartment or something, and they said, hey, you know, I'm jacking up your rent another thousand bucks. Yep. This bill would may, may prevent them from doing that, correct? Yes, okay. that's right. And so it would say it's not putting, again, a cap on landlords to say that you can only increase it a, a certain amount, but a landlord cannot bring a tenant to court moving forward if this bill is passed on unreasonable rent that is that that they just kind of exponentially increase that a tenant can't afford anyway. They can't say that that rent is, is going to be the basis of a, a non-payment filing, for example, and tenants would have the right to contest or challenge some of those unreasonable spikes um, so that they, they have a little bit more of, 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 a, of a shot. Let me just read this to you. I thought this was very interesting. Sure. So State Senator Brian Kavanaugh, he's been on our show many times. Um, yeah, great. He, he um, 
He's the chair of the Senate Housing Committee, and he had a very interesting quote. He said, um, you cannot be evicted from, from your home unless your landlord has good cause to do that. It's that simple. And this right. is the quote. This idea of eviction for profit is a relatively new th thing in New York in the past decade. So mm -hmm. what, what is he saying? I mean, it's almost like, you know, uh, I mean, we know landlords are not in the not-for-profit business, okay? They're, they're in the business for profit. We understand that. Yeah. So who's going to make the determination as to how much profit they're allowed to make, I guess? Because you can't say this idea of eviction for profit is relatively a new thing. It's not a new thing. Everyone's always wanted to get new tenants in so they can make more money. That's what landlords do. But this bill will, would prevent that in, in a such a way that I think the court would determine the yeah. amount of profit. Am I correct with that? See well, so I, my understanding, and I will, I, I think the the biggest um, one of the biggest barriers, or one of the biggest concerns, I think that the tenant movement, and I'll, I'll completely echo this from the perspective of an attorney in housing court, and what a lot of my colleagues see, is that the humanity behind what tenants are struggling through. I think this is something that, that's often forgotten about in the wider narrative is that it's not, it shouldn't be about profit over people. It's about people over, you know, people, over, our, our lives are on the line, right? And tenants' lives who, um, you know, they they have done, they, you know, we, the demographic that the cross-section of the pie that we're, we see often in these courts are single parents, you know, black and brown, uh, Latin communities, undocumented residents who um, really are, are, are here to make a better life for their families, for themselves. And 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 I think the, the kind of where this fits into the bigger matrix of good cause and, and what um, the, the kind of narrative around who is part of these housing complexes, you know, who lives in these apartments. So can, can, um, we, can we make a, a distinction between the big corporate landlords and the small landlords that, you know, have that, you know, two, three family bedroom kind of thing and they're just trying to get by? Is that is that a possibility within the bill or is it just it's a blanket if you're a landlord, we're, we're limiting that. We're going to limit what you can do in terms of rent increases. You understand? There's it a is, difference in terms of humanity, is. really, because when you're talking about humanity, yeah. these, these corporate landlords have so much money behind them, yet yeah. the mom and pop landlords don't. Right. What, what, how do we reconcile that, if we can see it? I mean, I would just say that there, there are way more of the bigger corporate yeah. And he's in at least New York City than there are the, the mom and pop landlords. And I do think that the, you know, from from my kind of personal perspective, and I think one that we um, often have to, to be very conscious about in this work is that, um, yes, and the, the, the human struggle behind affordability, behind, you know, being able to keep up with properties, being able to, to house tenants and to stay housed is a real one kind of on both sides. I, I do want to, to recognize to recognize that. Um, but I will say that that the majority of, um, like, let's take repairs, for example, individuals who are really, really fighting for basic repairs in their apartments, who, who live in these private, unregulated apartments, um, where landlords just want them out. And, and it doesn't matter necessarily who that landlord. Yeah, it's, it's just profit. It's, it's, just it's profit. Just profit at the end of the day. Right, exactly. And so I think I think there's there's a real, like, we, we do contend with that, that kind of scenario a lot. Um, well, and, you know, and, we, 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 we don't, we're, unfortunately, we're actually out of time. But oh, we'd like, you to, we'd like you to, yeah, it flies, it does. We'd like you to come back. Oh, we'd thank like you. to let us know how the bill is faring, um, sure. maybe, maybe the strength of it, and maybe there's been some tweaking, and uh, you can give us an update because um, you, I think the viewers would really appreciate it. It's a very important topic. Thank you. Thank you. And is it, is it okay if I give a pitch for, you know, for Bronx Defenders in terms of like our hotline? Absolutely. We have a, we have Absolutely. A housing right now, go. Show okay. Me. So we also, I just wanted to, you know, put a pitch to the community and to residents who are still in need of um, an attorney. We cannot guarantee representation right now, right now due to capacity, but we do have a housing hotline that we have made available. Um, it's every other Monday from nine to five you know, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, the number to dial into that is 845-288-2611. And again, this is just for us to provide information and, and general legal advice around your circumstances if they concern um, the threat of eviction. So please link, link us in. All Take right, care. stay with us. Today's verdict has so much more right after this. All right, uh, welcome back 
to uh, today's verdict. I'm your host and trial attorney, uh, David Lesh. It's um, it's rare when I when I not only um, have a guest on the show that I know is extremely competent, but I happen to know the guest personally. It makes me very happy. Um, attorney uh, John Schmidt uh, is on the uh, on the show today, and um, a uh, newfound career as a meteor mediator. Uh, John, how are you doing today? I'm just great. It's great to be with you, David. It's a pleasure. All right, so John, we we know each other. We're actually on the op we were on opposite sides of the aisle, as um, I represent plaintiffs who've been injured, and you um, worked for the city of New York. So, but before we get into um, your your role now as a mediator, or a private mediator, let's tell the viewers a little bit about you and uh, how you came uh, to this point in your career, if you could. Sure. So I went to Seton Hall Law School, graduated in 1992. Um, took a job with uh, a small firm, Biagi and Biagi, downtown Manhattan, did that for about two years, <clears throat> and then found myself at HRA doing liens and recovery. So for about three years till about 1997, I was uh, negotiating and compromising liens on behalf of the Human Resources Administration. So that gave me a lot of exposure to negotiating with uh, adversaries. Since 1999, I've been with the law department. I started as a pretrial attorney, um, was made supervisor within a year, and was really put in charge of the in-house settlement project in 2003, um, when the city decided that it made a lot of sense to try to get rid of the cases that we needed to get rid of early, because we could do it cheaper, and we could, um, we could save a lot on the carrying costs of litigation. So, and I did that for 23 years. So you're there, so there you are, you know, really, you know, in, 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 the, in the back of the courtroom, really, um, or in the front of the courtroom, however you want to say it, with these cases that came one after another um, with the judge and you're negotiating and you're, and you're, and you're, you're moving cases along. So you understand cases, you understand the merits of a case, you understand the damages of a case, because that's how you would end up either deciding what to put put on money or not to put on money, right? You understood the case, am I correct? Yes, yes. So, so now, we, now we're present day, okay? And it's time for you uh, to move on and you wanna become, or, or should I say, you wanna move into the private mediation field. What was your motivation there, John? Well, my motivation was really that um, the court system has slowed down significantly. As anybody who knows uh, how it works, they're, they are not in control of a calendar anymore. Your case, you cannot rely on your case being moved along by the courts. I think this is a great opportunity to do mediations and arbitrations because there's really no alternative right now. And from all looks of it, this is never going back to the way it was when we were would conference, you know, 40 cases in one day. They just don't want those kind of crowds. So I think this is going to be a great time to be doing arbitrations and mediations because I'm hoping that the parties are going to recognize that on both sides of the aisle, it's beneficial to get rid of cases early if you can. All right. So let's walk the viewers through it because, you know, maybe their attorney might know, but certainly they don't understand. So um, both sides decide, you know what, this isn't worth going to trial. Trial expenses are so, it can, can be ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 for trial. Let's go to private mediation. Explain to the viewer what that really means so they understand when their attorney tells them I'm going to go to private mediation. Maybe you can explain well, it. Well, actually, it's, um, it's hiring a third party, a neutral, to assist in the negotiations of the case. So the neutral's job is to find out, is this really something that can be resolved with both parties being relatively happy and both parties being relatively unhappy? So just like conferencing a case in court, <clears throat> you get to talk to both sides. Um, there is, uh, it, it gets rid of the in inhibition of lack of trust on the other side. Um, you listen to one side, you listen to the other side, and you try in your mind to formulate a deal that works for both sides. Do you like having the, 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 the parties them themselves there, the plaintiff, maybe the defendant, or, or does it seem maybe as a case by case basis in terms of in terms of who you want in that room with you when you really start getting everybody together? I think the parties themselves, the attorneys for the parties themselves are the best people to make that determination. I have done conferences for 25 years without the parties being pr present. 
and it's always worked for me. But in some instances, there are times when it's better to have a party or the parties there. Okay, so let's, uh, so now we're, we're into mediation now. And um, um, two attorneys, we've decided, uh, we picked you, you're the guy. What are you looking for? What are we sending you so you could start? And do you, do you prepare before the mediation in, in, terms of, in terms of the docs or do you wanna wait till we get there? What do you wanna do? I always like to be prepared before I start dealing with this stuff. And I always have. So even if I had 40 cases on the calendar, I knew something about every one of those cases. So the best thing to do <clears throat> is to send your theory of liability or your theory of your defense in writing. It can be brief um, documents that support that medical records that support the claim of whatever the injury is. And I would love to go through that before the mediation. Are there any particular types of cases you want to mediate more than others? Or are you really willing to take on almost any type of, I guess, negligence type of case or medical malpractice case? You tell me. I would, I would take on any one of those cases, but I just think from my own perspective, um, premises liability cases and motor vehicle accidents are great cases to mediate because they're almost never motionable. So the, the prudent thing to do is to explore settlement. So I would say that's what I would do. And what I've been thinking about, I wanted to ask you is what about the city cases? Um, would you take them on if you, if you never had anything really to do with those cases personally? What's your thoughts on that? Can you, I, I don't know. I would, I would take them on. I have a, um, I have a non-compete for a year. Okay. Um, of course, I couldn't do anything with any case that I've done, but I would take them on because they're negligent cases just like everything else. Right. And if anyone knows city cases, it's you. And if anyone understands, you know how that works. All right. All right. So how much time are we allotting here? Are you, uh, uh, an hour, two hours? How much time are you usually giving the parties in terms of being able to really work through these issues as you go from one room to the next room, back and yeah. forth? You know, I'm willing to go as long as you want. I believe they um, they suggest uh, booking in four hour blocks. Yeah. So, so, you know, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to do more than that. I'm hoping that we can resolve it quicker than that. But, you know, and by the way, you know, we should we should note very quickly. I mean, not quickly, but who are you working for? Where can we find you, by the way? Okay, so you'll find me on LinkedIn. I uh, posted an announcement when I retired from the city, which was last month. Um, I'm at the Jansen Group, they're in Jericho. Um, if you go to my LinkedIn page, all the information to contacting me is there, my personal cell phone number and the number to the Jansen Group. You know, we find here, you know, my brother and I, when, when we mediate cases, that a lot of times they, they may not settle at the mediation, but the mediator holds on to the case and keeps talking to us on the phone and the other side. And it could be a week, it could be two weeks, it could be a month. And then it settles. Are you going to keep the case? Is that how it's going to work also? I hope to. Um, that is how I settled cases for the city. Most of the times, you know, and you have to think about it. As you know, the court conference system is 40 cases in a half a day, right? Yeah. So you get, in, and for the people who show up, you're getting, you know, at maybe 10 minutes. So you, th you throw your initial salvo at me, I throw my initial salvo back at you, we put on for an adjourned date, but then in between those two dates, there's a lot of conversation going on. What's the best tips that you would give to maybe an attorney who's watching, who, you know, they're fairly new at this and, and they want to start settling a case. And, um, you know, it's, it's, they, don't, they, don't, they don't want to try the case, the client wants the case settled quickly. What's a tip you may want to give them if you could? The key to it for me is, um, well, you have to realize from the defense perspective, we are overwhelmed with cases. So from a defense perspective, once you track down the person who is responsible for or has the authority to negotiate a settlement on that case, you really have to be reasonable because when I'm looking at a case and it comes a lot with trust and getting to know people, but if you give me an outrageous demand, there's just no way I can spend time going through the file. If you gave me a million dollar demand for a broken finger with no surgery, it, it's not prudent for me to go through the file and try to figure out what it is. So there's a filter there. So you have to give a reasonable demand. That would be the most important part to me because that catches the eye. Everybody wants to settle cases, but a reasonable demand catches the eye I of the person on the other side and says, wow, this is really possible. Um, well, you don't have too much time. Any final thoughts? Because we're wishing you, you know, the best here. We know, we, we, we know, we know, we know how competent you are. That's for sure. And um, 
You know what? Listen, I, I, at one point, you know, I was a court attorney and I left the court system to, to work with my father. So I know what it's like to to move from one hat to the next hat, moving from someone who was impartial as a court attorney to now wearing the hat of a plaintiff. Do you feel comfortable and confident now as you move from wearing one hat to the next hat? I think the biggest benefit I had is as a defense attorney is I could see things from the other side. That's why, you know, and I had a very simple strategy. I want to try to be fair. I'm not looking to beat you. I'm not looking, I'm looking to get a settlement that I can live with, that you can live with so that you come back. That's the way it works. Um, the one thing I would like to mention before we leave is, you know, your father was very instrumental in teaching me great lessons about settlements. So very early on in my settlement career, we used to hold in-house conferences. Um, Bernie London would be there. And one day your father comes in and I forgot the case, the details of it, but the, the gist of it is, it is Saul, I can offer you $20,000. He said, John, I really respect that you offered me that, but I'm not going to take it. So I'm like, Saul, I think it's a pretty fair offer. Why wouldn't you take it? So he says, I'm going to tell you something that I know about the way the city works. That's going to explain to you why I'm not taking this settlement. So he says, you offered me $20,000 today. I'll make a motion. Tomorrow at the motion calendar, you'll offer me $25,000. And I'll fight and fight and fight. And then we'll get to a conference and you'll offer me $30,000. And then at a final conference before it goes out to trial, you'll offer me $40,000. And it goes on and on like that. So why would I take your $20,000 today? <laughs> so I said to him, you know, you're right, but think about all the work you have to do to get there. And, you know, he was right. You know, it, it's worth it to hold on in, in that kind of scheme of thought. But then we changed the way we thought. Like, what are we going to pay on this? That became the philosophy of the city. Like, what is this really worth to us, even at the end? Let's just try to get rid of it and save the cost. And that's really just a good lesson for medi mediations to begin with. Listen, John, it's been a pleasure. We wish you um, really good luck with the Jansen Group. Um, and we expect you to come back on, let you know, let you know, um, let us know how, it, how it's going, how you're enjoying it. And uh, we will definitely make sure that the viewers and the attorneys see that you're available because um, you're a good person to, uh, to mediate a case. All right? Thank you, David. It's always good to see you and say hello to Gary for me. I promise I will. All right, today's verdict has so much more right after this. All right, well, that's all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank both of our guests for joining us and, of course, you, the viewers, for watching. If you have an issue or a topic you'd like to see on a future edition of Today's Verdict, just email me at davidlesh at bronxnet.org. Until the next time, know your issues, reach a verdict. I'll see you in two weeks.